Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tim Clinton for Family Talk. Where do you go to receive support and advice for your family? You know, we interact with thousands of people every day through our Facebook page. There you're going to find inspiring advice on what matters most to you. Whether it's marriage or parenting, you can be sure our profile will keep you updated with how your family can succeed. Visit us at facebook.com forward slash Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Each day, you're going to find our latest broadcast, helpful resources, inspirational pictures and quotes. Nowhere else are you going to be able to start your day with a thought from Dr. Dobson, as well as a special message before you go to sleep. Remember, you can be sure that every post on our page is created with you and your family in mind. Take time to visit us and become a part of our online community on Facebook, will you? Simply go to facebook.com forward slash Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Today on Family Talk. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk. Uh, Yesterday, we were talking with Kathy Laurie. Uh, She is a wife and grandmother and the author of a book, which we were discussing entitled, As I See It. Uh, She's also the co-founder of Harvest Christian Fellowship. At the end of the program, we were discussing the meaning of life from a Christian perspective. And that took us into those difficult periods when God doesn't seem to make sense. That's a subject that I've addressed many times, and I've even devoted a book to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kathy, let me have you talk about it from your perspective, because you've been there. You've experienced tragedy Mm -hmm. in your own family because you lost a beloved son, didn't you? We have two boys. Um, Christopher, our firstborn, uh, he was 33 years old, and uh, it was the happiest time of our lives, Dr. Dobson, um, for, for my husband, Greg, in particular, because he had suffered so much as a young person in a dysfunctional home with no one who he could really call a father. Um, he made it his determined purpose that his family would always know that he was there and the love that he had for them. And Christopher had a few years in uh, high school where he wandered and uh, lived a prodigal life, not ever disrespecting Greg or ever even stopping going to church. He lived sort of a a secret life of um, waywardness, but he came back with a vengeance to the Lord. And in those last few years of his life, he was fully serving Jesus. He was working as the art director at our church. And Greg and he had the most intimate and close relationship a father and son could ever have. It was really the most um, joyous time of our lives. He had married. He had a, a little girl named Stella who was two years old, and he was expecting his second child, um, Lucy, who would be born in November, the year that uh, he was taken in July. And uh, Christopher was on his way to church. He was working, as I said, as the graphic designer, lead designer for um for Harvest Ministries, and on his way there, he met a terrible accident. There was a, a car that was uh, street sweeping the carpool lane, and uh, they the cones and the lights that had warned the cars behind that there was a vehicle in front were not lit, and he plowed into the back of that unexpectedly, and his life was instantly over, and he was already in the presence of the Lord. For Greg and myself, it was so traumatic. He was just gone, gone from our lives. And and we had no chance to prepare for that. It came so suddenly out of the blue. It was a trauma that, that occurred in our lives that I pray that we will never experience anything like that again. Kathy, did the Lord carry you during that very, very difficult time? I felt for myself and for Greg that um, had it not been for the Lord, I don't think we could have gone on. Um, When we heard the news, um, Greg walked into the house and just collapsed. He just crumbled on the floor. And I walked over to him and I then I looked over at my daughter-in-law who was expecting her second child. And all I could think of was, Jesus, you have to get us through this. And I don't understand 
all about suffering, and I know that I'm talking to a lot of people that are listening to our voice, and uh, my suffering and, and our trauma may not be the same as theirs, but I do know that there is a God in heaven who promises us that he will walk with us through our sorrows. Even when we don't have the answers to those sorrows, he promises us he will be there. And can I tell you that my experience of the Lord that day and in the subsequent days, I wish that I could have that closeness to him that I experienced as we went through those tidal waves. He was nearer than I have ever known him to be. His word was true. The scriptures and the truths of scripture and those specific passages of those who have suffered in scripture became such close companions to me. I couldn't breathe without meditating on what God had told me in his word that was my life breath to get me through those days. For many people, when they go through times of tragedy, uh, they often blame God for it and they feel like they can't trust him anymore. But in your case, the loss of your son, Christopher, actually drew you to the Lord instead of pushing him away. You rested in his arms, didn't you? I did, and the reason I could, um, Dr. Dobson, and I'm so grateful, and this is one of my passions in teaching women the Bible and, and telling them the importance of knowing the scriptures is that I didn't just pick and choose the passages of my Bible that I became acquainted with. I read the Bible through, and I knew that there were those who had suffered. In Hebrews, it talks of those who were suffering, not just the ones who were delivered, but the ones who actually were martyred for their faith, that were put into situations where there was no happy ever after ending. And it's very clear, the scriptures give us many examples of wonderful heroes of the faith that that died in, in their old age, and they were taken in a wonderful, comfortable way. But there were so many passages in the Bible that I came across that I realized I wasn't the only one who had ever suffered. These were saints in the Old Testament and the New Testament who became my close companions as I walked that sorrowful road. They gave me hope. And they put my hope in the right place, that that God was in control, even when I couldn't understand it, that he promised to bring good things, wonderful things out of tragedy. Kathy, let me uh, read for our listeners the beloved passage in the 11th chapter of Hebrews that talks about those people that suffered for Christ. And we'll start with the 37th verse. They were put to death by stonings. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not even worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And what they'd been promised is the coming of the Messiah. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. That's a wonderful, encouraging, and inspirational scripture for those that are going through hard times. Yes, it is difficult, but God sees it. And ultimately, we will gain the crown of righteousness for remaining faithful. I love that verse because even though these people were suffering, they didn't lose their faith. And that's why they are listed in the Heroes Hall of Faith. And the scriptures tell us that we aren't promised a trouble-free life. And I think that if we understand that, we are living in a fallen world. We're living in these in-between times, between the already and the not yet. Um, Our sins are forgiven. Christ is risen from the grave. He's given us hope and a future that we can count on. But we're not in heaven yet. The devil is still alive and well on planet Earth. And so we don't have the assurance that even as believers that we are going to never experience tragedy or heartbreak or suffering. But what we do have 
is a God who has promised in Romans 8, 28, that he is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And, and there's a reward for those who remain faithful. Yes. And can I honestly say that um, just as the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee in the midnight storm and they thought they were going to drown, we know the story that Jesus came to them walking on the water, on the very storm, on the waves that they feared. And in the in that day, in that moment, scriptures like that came vividly to my mind, that in the midst of that excruciating news, I could lean into Jesus and say, I don't see you, but your word tells me that you're there that your word tells me that you will not leave me or forsake me, that you are here with me to the very end, and that you're going to walk with us through this heartbreak. And and we lived in the scriptures, Dr. Dobson. It was the thing that sustained us. And if we're allowing God to to sow the word of God into our lives, to plant those seeds, those scriptures, it's in that moment, it's too late to call your favorite pastor, to run to your favorite devotional, to call your best friend on the phone. Even if those people could help you, what you need is a personal and living relationship with Jesus himself. Kathy, that ought to be your next book. Uh, You said that Greg has been telling you that, and I think he's right, because there are so many people out there who are going through hard times, and uh, they need the Lord. And they need the encouragement to continue serving him even under the most difficult of circumstances. I think that that is the great privilege of my life. It is one that um, I feel more and more strongly, especially after the Lord took Christopher to heaven, because I knew that sooner or later, everyone and the women in my congregation were going to face tragedy and difficulty and hardship and suffering. And I knew that what I had was not, I'm not a superwoman. I I am not a great woman of faith, but I have a great God who has given me his word. And those, the word of God was planted as a seed in my heart. And when I needed it in that moment, he was there. Let's go back to Christopher's life. I know how much you cherished him. He went to Biola University in Southern California, and so did my son, Ryan. And the two of them were good friends. Did you know that? Yes, they were. I did know that. Yes. I'm telling you that when Christopher was lost, it affected my Ryan very deeply. It was a personal thing for him. And I know other people loved him as well. And so it's difficult for you to talk about even now, I'm sure. I should have asked you about that before I raised the memory today. No, it's fine. I I know that God allowed me, you know, the scriptures tell us that we comfort with the comfort with which we've been comforted. And I know part of the the purpose in allowing Greg and myself to go through what we went through is so that we might be able to pour into and minister to other people who have gone or are going through similar things. Let's go back to your book. We started our discussion last time with As I See It. And uh, you tell a number of stories, I think about 80 of them in the book. And one of them made reference to a time when you and Greg were out for a walk and you encountered a man named Roy. And in your discussion with him, you began to be aware that he might not know Jesus. Tell us that story. Oh, yeah. Greg and I would walk every morning in our neighborhood and we would come across pretty regularly an elderly gentleman who... um, whose name was Roy. He lived up the street. And uh, just through passing conversations, we would stand for a few minutes because we were out walking briskly. And he he would stop periodically because he had congestive heart failure. And uh, he told us that at times he had to stop to catch his breath. And we'd come upon Roy and we began having conversations with him. And Roy did not know Jesus. We were certain about that. And Greg would share little things with him along the way and uh, plant seeds and just introduce the subject of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Well, Roy was very pleasant, but um, he would would 
you know, kind of break off the conversation after a little while, and uh, and we would go on our way. Well, one morning, Greg and I were sitting at our breakfast nook at breakfast, and um, we looked out the front window, and we could see Roy taking another little break on the corner, and uh, he would do that to catch his breath, and uh, Greg said, today is the day. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to ask Roy if he would like to pray to receive Jesus as his Savior. And he went outside, and I stood in the kitchen, watched Greg walk across the street, and just take on the subject um, specifically and say, Roy, do you know if you died today that you would go to heaven? And he said, no, I do not. And he says, do you know that you can? And Greg shared the gospel with him one more time. And on the corner, right in front of our house, he prayed to receive Jesus. And then within a, within a few days, we, we ran across Roy again and followed up with him, gave him a Bible, encouraged him to get into church. And he said, do you know that now when I stop, because my heart, I have severe chest pain, that when I stop and I suffer, I think about Jesus who suffered for me on the cross. And we knew he had taken that that message of salvation and was able to understand that he had a God who loved him, a God who had also suffered and was able to be there for him. A year or so later, Roy had a massive heart attack and went to, to be with the Lord in heaven. And um, it just showed Greg and myself that ministry isn't just from a pulpit. Ministry is in our neighborhoods. It's with the people that we come across every day that need Jesus. And if we'll have our eyes open and our hearts in sync with the heartbeat of our Savior, that we will reach out to them with the gospel. You know, I wish every Christian would be aware, as you are, of this responsibility to the Great Commission. Uh, You know, when we're out with people, when we're encountering people that we don't know, Uh, to look for an opportunity to share our faith with them because there are so many people around us who do not know Christ and they don't know where they're going and they have no hope of eternal life. Uh, We have to remember to do what we can uh, to introduce those people to him. And you know, Dr. Dobson, I think one of the big needs in our world today, people are more lonely than they have ever been. We're very connected through the internet and through social media, but we're finding more and more and more, especially in younger people, an isolation that has come because of our devices. We're too busy looking at screens and communicating via text messages or on social media that we don't have vital relationships with people. So the door is wide open for us who come not only from families where, you know, our homes are families, but our church is a family. We need to invite people to church to experience what the family of God can be. Kathy, I want to tell you a story that I have shared before, and some of our listeners will have heard it, but it's precious to me. Shirley's stepdad uh, did not know Jesus. In the early days of when he married my wife's mother, After the marriage broke up, he was the sweetest man. Uh, Everybody loved Joe. His name was Joe Kubista, and uh, he would go to church with his wife, Alma, and he would talk about being a Christian, but he never got specific about it. And we began worrying about him as he grew older because we really didn't know what his faith journey had been. In his late 80s, we were really concerned. We just wanted the assurance that he was ready to go to heaven. And so at an appropriate time, I uh, asked to have lunch with him. I took him to a lunch, and we sat down. We talked about small talk and things. And then I said, Joe, there's something I really have to talk to you about because it's very important. Would you tell me what your faith journey has been like? And he said, oh, Jimmy, you don't have to worry about that. And I said, why? And he said, because when I was nine years old, which means when his mother died, the priest took me into a little room and talked to me. That stymied me because I didn't know what that meant. I didn't want to tell him, well, you thought you were a Christian, but you weren't. And yet I didn't have the details. And so we just continued to pray for him. And he would go to church even when Alma didn't go. 
And in those days, you know, you did not talk about your faith. Well, time went on and he came down with leukemia and he was 90 and Shirley and I went to the hospital to see him. And I brought up the subject again. I said, Joe, have you made arrangements to be in heaven with the Lord? And he changed the subject. And I really got serious with him. I said, Joe, listen to me. You're going to talk to me about this because it's too important not to discuss. I want you to tell me about your relationship with the Lord. Joe turned his face to the wall and he cried. He just, I mean, he cried like a baby. And I knew something was going on. And, uh, you know, sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do is to talk to your own family about Christ. So we ask a local Baptist minister to come and pray with him and to talk to him. And he led Joe into a marvelous relationship with Jesus Christ. This man who never talked about anything personal put both hands in the air and he said, Jimmy, I'm saved. (laughs) I'm saved. Oh, it's glorious. And the next night we came back and he said, I feel so clean. I feel so clean inside. And he died several weeks after that. And uh, when he died, he was talking about seeing the angels coming uh, to him in the last days of his life. Amazing. And Joe is in heaven today because we wouldn't give up on him. I don't know what his relationship with Christ was, but now I have no question. I want to say to those who are listening to us out there, you have family members whom you love. You have people in your neighborhood, people that are even in your church and really don't know Jesus. Don't give up on them. Take them to the cross. That's right. Pray for them and pray specifically that the Lord would give you that opportunity to have a conversation like that. Um, it's The Lord is faithful. He has... He has this in his hands, and all we need to do is just be available. He opens the doors around us all the time, or our eyes open enough to walk through them when they happen. Kathy Laurie, I've loved talking to you on these programs. I hope we can do it again. Thank you. Do you love the Lord? I do, Dr. Dobson. He loved me first. (laughs) Give Greg our love and appreciation for all he does, and please do come back and be with us again. What a pleasure and a privilege for me. Thank you. I'm Roger Marsh, and I hope Kathy Laurie's story and wisdom have ministered to you over the past couple of programs. Be sure to visit our broadcast page for more information about Kathy's book, her blog, and her women's ministry at Harvest. Go to drjamesdobson.org and then click onto today's broadcast page. The mission of Family Talk is to support you and your family. And one way we do that is providing you with materials to fight for your marriage and your children. Our resources page at drjamesdobson.org will empower you to do just that. This collection includes many of Dr. Dobson's best-selling books, teaching DVDs, radio broadcasts, and much more. These tools cover topics such as parenting, passing on a godly legacy, and battling for your marriage. The next time your family is struggling, know that we care about you and we are here to help. Go now and look through our vast library of resources to find what you and your family would benefit from. That's drjamesdobson.org and then click on the Resources tab. As we wrap things up for today, I want to thank you for your faithful financial support of the Ministry of Family Talk. It's listeners just like you who sustain this ministry and propel our vision for the future forward. Learn how you can support us by going to drjamesdobson.org or by calling 877-732-6825. I'm Roger Marsh. Have a great weekend. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tim Clinton, Executive Director of the James Dobson Family Institute. As we get ready for summer, I want to tell you why now is a great time to partner with us. A special friend of our ministry has provided us with a matching grant to help get us through these tough summer months. 
Right now, any donation you make to the James Dobson Family Institute will be doubled. That match will remain in place, by the way, until we reach our goal. As a part of this journey, we're going to keep you posted on our progress. I urge you, would you take advantage of this right now? Stand with us here at Family Talk. With the rapid growth of the Dobson Family Institute, we need your help more than ever. Go online right now to drjamesdobson.org. Or you can call us toll-free, 877-732-6825. That number again, toll-free, 877 877- 732-6825, and you can learn how to stand with us. Your generous contributions allow us to continue to fight for marriages and families around the world. Our website again, drjamesdobson.org, drjamesdobson.org, or call again, toll-free, 877-732-6825. Make sure and get in on this matching grant, will you? And we're so grateful for your persistent prayers and support. May God's blessings be on you.